next chapter, we're going to talk about uh, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which I'm going to mention here. But, you know, in chapter 6, that's when we really start to see the tribulation period. That is the tribulation period. Now, what you're seeing here in chapters 4 and 5 is you're seeing a setting of the stage, basically. You've got to look at it like that. If this were to be a movie, you know, movies periodically cut, you know, and they take a moment to set the stage and tell you a little background and, and whatnot. You know, we see that throughout the book of Revelation. But this first, these first two uh, chapters that are relate to the throne room in heaven, uh, that's basically, you know, it's going to be referred to, and you're going to see the four living creatures and the elders throughout the book. So this is giving you a little background about what's going on up there, who these guys are. Now, you may remember, I've said it every week, and this is probably the last time I'll say it, that the outline was given in chapter 1. Uh, Jesus says to John, he says, write down what you see, which he's talking about chapter 1, see the glorified Christ, what is, which is the seven churches of Asia Minor and their spiritual condition, and by extension, the spiritual condition of all churches that exist today, and then what will take place. Now, we're up here, and when you see in chapter 4, he says to John, he says, come up here and I will show you what must take place. Well, we're into the third and the longest part of this outline, okay? We're into the meat of the book, okay? Now, you know, one of the things that I need to remind you, which is very, very important because we're believers, and you need to, I'm going to try to remind you throughout this study, there's no more church mentioned after chapter 4. It's not even implied until chapter 19 when we come back with Christ to establish his kingdom. Why I'm reminding you of that is because we have been raptured. We're in heaven when this takes place, okay? Now, remember, you know, we're, we're raptured, we're rewarded, and we're glorified. Now, that is represented by the 24 elders, okay? They're representing the church. Now, to make, you know, to make that point a little stronger, uh, I remember I feel like I failed you last time when I was telling you about, the, you know, the 24 number represents the 24 orders of the priesthood that was established. Well, when you, when you think about what the priesthood, the priest, they represent uh, the people before God. So when you see the 24 elders, the 24 number is the priesthood, order priesthood that's been established, but focus mostly on the fact that they are representing the 24 elders, the church. They're representing all the church, okay, of all time. All the raptured church is up there, and they're represented by those 24 elders. Now, they saw God the Father. He's on the throne, obviously. He's had the seven spirits which represent the Holy Spirit. We see the living creatures, which are the cherubim, okay? They're highest order of angelic beings. They're guarding the throne. They're guarding God's holiness. They're all present. And then we see a rainbow, as we talked about last week. We're used to seeing a rainbow, and that means the storm has been. Well, this particular rainbow is coming before the storm begins. And that was highlighted by the thunders, uh, peals of thunder and flashes of lightning. Now, we all know here on earth when we have those, we know a storm's coming. Well, in Revelation, it means judgment is coming. Now, you know, that's very important. Now, the question should be, as we go over chapter 4, is who is, who is it that is noticeably absent in chapter 4? Well, and that's not the answer I'm looking for. The church, church is represented, okay, by the 24 elders. Who, it's a pretty obvious question. Who is obviously absent in chapter 4? Notably absent. Come on, you know this, this answer. Jesus. Jesus is not there. Don't you think that's unusual? Now, so we have the throne. We have worship being highlighted, which we talked a lot about. We see God's holiness on display in chapter 4. Now, let's turn over to chapter 5. It says, then, which is a continuation, okay, of chapter 4, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. Now, in the right hand of God the Father is this scroll. Now, remember, this is John's second vision. It's a continuation of his second vision, okay? It's the first glimpse that we have of heaven's throne room. It's the first glimpse that we have behind the curtain, okay? And that's what we're seeing. 
Now that scroll has writing on both sides. That means that there's no room to write anything else. That means it's complete. Now remember, there were no printing presses back in that day. So they didn't have paper like we had, so they usually wrote those scrolls on papyrus plant, okay? Now, each seal had to be broken by the proper person, okay? Not anybody could break the seal. You know, it had to be broken by the proper heir, and then once that seal, first seal is broken, it basically reveals a page. Think about an eight and a half by 11 page or so, and, you know, of what's going to take place on earth. But the bottom line is, this is the title deed to earth that God has in his hand. Now, when we talk about God has us in his palm of his hand, he literally has the future of mankind in the palm of his hand here. Now, God's will for judging the world, now, he's about to give that responsibility over to somebody. Now, one of the ways we like to say things, we like to say things like, you know, the... Uh, He's getting ready to kickstart things, or fat ladies getting ready to sing, or, or it's the beginning of the end. We like to say all those kind of things. Well, this literally is. Let me give you a preview, just the first two verses of chapter 6, talking about the beginning of the end. Revelation 6, 1 through 2, it says, I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures saying a voice like thunder, and said, Come. I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. Now, anybody want to take a guess who that rider is? The very first rider of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Who is this guy? He's evil. He's the Antichrist, okay? Now, when he says that he held a bow, but he didn't have any arrows. He was a political leader, okay? He was given a crown. He was given a title. He was given a country, and he rode out as conqueror. Now, we'll get all into the Antichrist as we go forward, but not tonight. Now, basically, what unfolds beginning in chapter 6 is first of three sets of judgment. This one will be called the seven seal judgments. That's what we're looking at here. But all these judgments are in that scroll, Okay. The last seal all opens up another set of judgments. The second set of judgments is the seven trumpet judgments. And then the final set of judgments is seven bowl judgments. Now, each one increases in intensity. Okay, so it gets tougher and tougher and tougher each time that one of those seals is open. Now, this is how serious it is. I, I borrowed this one, jumping ahead, give you a taste of how serious it is what we're talking about here. In Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. This is after the seventh seal. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Now, it was so powerful of a situation here that even the angels were at a loss for words. Think about that. There was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. That's how serious it is. God literally has the whole world in his hands. Now, if you go over to verse 2, then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. So they don't have anybody that's worthy. Apparently nobody up there is worthy. Now I want you to remember who's up there. Remember who's up there in heaven. Now, the Old Testament saints have not been resurrected. We have. The church has been resurrected. We've been raptured. That means we've been resurrected. Dead in Christ shall rise. So we're up there. But the Old Testament saints have not been resurrected, but they are there in spirit. Okay? Now, Abraham's up there in spirit. David's up there in spirit. Moses, Daniel, Joseph, Elijah, they're all up there in spirit. Okay? But they're not worthy to grab hold of that scroll. Okay, now Michael, the archangel, Gabriel's up there, God's messenger angel, they're up there. Holy Spirit's up there, right? Peter, Paul, all those, you know, those resurrected New Testament saints, they're up there. They've been raptured with the church. But none of those guys, John the Baptist is up there. Nobody is worthy 
to open up the uh, seals. Nobody's worthy to take that scroll from God's hands. Now, basically, we're talking about a who's who of the Old Testament and New Testament saints. Now, that's pretty powerful. Well, John, he starts weeping. He's upset. He's really gotten away with because no one seems to be worthy. He's completely devastated. Now, the question is, why is he completely devastated? Why did that affect him so much? Now, first of all, keep in mind, John is not in heaven physically. He's having a vision of heaven, but he's still, he knows that his body's still on the island of Patmos. Okay, so he's still being exiled. He's still being in probably forced labor, so he knows what an injustice life on earth is. Now, Basically, when he sees that no one is able to open up the seals, no one is able to take that scroll, no one's worthy, he's thinking, you know, the hope that he had that God would come and settle the accounts, that Jesus would come back for a brief moment, you know, that hope has gone away for him. Okay? He sees all this injustice. Now, keep in mind what he's seen. He's seen persecution. He's been exiled to the island of Patmos. He has seen Jerusalem completely destroyed in A.D. 70, because this is around A.D. 95 when he, you know, he writes the book of Revelation. He's seen his people martyred. He's seen his people murdered. He's seen all his uh, fellow apostles, all 11. He's the only one that was not martyred for their faith. He's seen all that. And then he's seen Jesus crucified. Remember, John is the only one that was at the foot of the cross. The rest of them fled. John saw it all. Jesus entrusted John to take Mary and to look after her, okay? He was the apostle that Jesus loved, okay? Now, here he is. He's seeing that, and he's holding on to hope that God will make things right again. He's been holding on to hope that God was going to settle all the accounts. He was holding on to the hope that the good guy is going to win. Now, we can understand that. Let me ask you a question. How would you feel without that hope? Let me underline that the good guy is going to win. Now, what if you felt like that hope was being taken away from you in this world that we live in? And keep in mind, we're some blessed people in here, okay? We're some mighty blessed people in America. We complain a lot. We certainly do. But, you know, we have tunnel vision because the rest of the world goes through a whole lot more than we do. So it's bad enough for us what we're seeing, right? Okay, how would you like it if your hope was taken away? The things will never be made right again. We'd be helpless. You know, I imagine the suicide rate would increase, don't you think? I mean, what would be the point in keeping on going? Do you ever get to point? Now, I know, you know, hopefully this life's got a lot of blessings for each and every one of us. And if you get, you know, yourself right with the Lord, he's going to bless you in and out over and over again once he gets you where you need to be, okay? That's not in question. But we all know, we look around. Let me jump over here since we're talking about that. You know, I was thinking about when I was a kid, I didn't have to worry about things like cyber warfare. You know, that was not on my radar, okay? I didn't have to worry about maybe checking my bank account and somebody, you know, hacked it and, you know, and it was empty. You know, that's not something I had to worry about. I didn't have to worry about UFOs. You said something about a UFO when I was growing up. You get laughed, you know, off the stage. I mean, you know, that was something that nobody believed in. Well, now, as I've said before, they have pilots that are going before Congress talking about what they've seen. So something's out there flying around. That's worrisome, right? You know, we didn't have to worry about artificial intelligence, okay? And, you know, that that might rise up and destroy humanity. You know, that was not a worry. We did have nuclear war, okay? But it seemed to be under control at, at one point in time. There was never any leaders threatening each other with nuclear war like they are now, right? Okay, uh, space travel, and we certainly didn't have to worry about our, our children not knowing, you know, if they were a guy or a girl. I mean, you know, making that decision. I mean, you know, we didn't have to worry about those things growing up. But now kids, they have to worry about all those things. That's, the, that's part of their life. And now am I exaggerating or, or am I right on? It's, you, know, you know, I guess here's what I'm saying. Sometimes with all these worries that I just named, it feels like, you know, that humanity is in a vice grip. You see what I'm saying? You can't escape it. You know, there's something like that coming at you a hundred, you know, I didn't even talk about the political environment, and we don't want to go there to misinformation that we're dealing with. We're never going back to the truth again. 
because people are profiting too much by keeping the lies going. So we're never coming back to the time where Walter Cronkite had 30 minutes to tell you the news. You know, he didn't have the time to tell you what he thought about it. I, I long for those days, but they're not coming back because people are getting filthy rich by keeping something stirred. People are getting filthy rich by getting us to hate each other, okay? That's what's going on, and, you know, and, and it's not going back. It's the new world we live in. Now, can you see how John felt? Well, I feel kind of similar. I, I want to know that, that Jesus is going to come back and make things right one day. I want to know that he's going to come back and he's going to take me, you know, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to have to live with this forever. That there's a beautiful place awaiting me, right? That there's hope. No matter how desperate your situation is, am I making any sense? Okay? Well, that's kind of what John was feeling at that time. Because all of a sudden, and, and you remember, he was exiled on the Isle of Patmos. You know, he didn't know that he would ever get off that island, okay? So he was away from everybody. He was being punished for preaching the word of God. So he's thinking, gosh, you know, the only hope I have is Jesus. And now you're saying I'm up here in heaven and there's no hope? Now that was pretty devastating for him. Okay. Now look over there in Revelation chapter 5, verse 5. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now, one of these elders comes up to John, and he basically says, Okay, look, don't be upset. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Now, who's he talking about when he's talking about the lion of the tribe of Judah? For those of you that went through our study of the book of Genesis, you may remember that. If you go all the way to Genesis chapter 49, when Jacob is taking all of his 12 sons, and he's passing out the blessings for them. Here's what he says to Judah in verse 8. He says, Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons. Test, test, test. I, I lost my voice. <laughs> but anyway, your father's sons will bow down to you. You are a lion's cub, O Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Like a lioness who dares to rouse him. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs, and the obedience of the nations is his. He's clearly describing Jesus there, okay? He's talking about Jesus. Now, when he's talking about the root of David, that should be understandable. He's talking about descendant of David, okay? Now, which is, you know, all throughout the New Testament. Now, John, he looks over there, and at the center of everything, the center of the throne, he's surrounded by the 24 elders, he's surrounded by the four living creatures, is what appears to be a lamb that has been slain, yet he's still alive. Now, what is the lamb that appears to be slain, what does that speak of? Still has his wounds. Who was wounded? Jesus was wounded at the cross, okay? He had, you know, he was slain, but he was resurrected, so he's still alive. Now, John chapter 1 verse 29 when John the Baptist saw him here's what he said the next day John saw Jesus coming towards him said look the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world so here we have the Lamb Jesus is there the star of the show now he has seven horns well in the Bible horns represent power so we're talking about seven is God's perfect number it's a number for completion so he has complete power he has seven eyes, all-knowing. We already know that represents the Holy Spirit, talking about the complete presence there. Now, keep in mind, Jesus, at this point, he's already conquered sin when he went to the cross. He's conquered death when he went to the cross. He's conquered Satan when he went to the cross. Now he's going to take back the world. Okay, now he's going to take back the world. Now, we've seen that before, right? Look at John chapter 16, verse 33. It says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. 
In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Now let me take another moment to get your spirits where they need to be. The reason we can take heart is because we have accepted Christ. You see what I'm saying? What's going to take place in the tribulation period is for sinful humanity who has rejected Christ. So throughout all this, never forget that if you're truly a believer, you will not be a part of that. Jesus says, take heart, I have overcome the world. So we need to continue to remind ourselves of that. Now, we also need to continue to remind ourselves that this is not a game. And there are souls that God's going to put in your path that he may want you to reach out to. And if you're not obedient, it's quite possible that they might not see eternity because of your disobedience. That's how it applies to us. Does that make any sense? Okay. Now, we might be relieved that we're going to be there, but we're going to be saddened because there are going to be so many people that we love that did not make it. Okay. We certainly won't be happy about it. Now, where have we seen that scroll before? Look at Daniel chapter 12. Verse 8, I heard, but I did not understand. So I asked my Lord, what will the outcome of all this be? He replied, go your way, Daniel, because the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Now, the point is, I guess it's probably around 600 years earlier, Daniel's received a series of visions related to the end times, primarily related to what happens to Israel in the end times, which we'll get into later. And he wanted to know how it would all end. Well, John is about to see it all firsthand. Okay? Daniel was told to close it up. It's going to be sealed until the end times. Well, the end times are here. And these seals are getting ready to be busted. Now, Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. You know, after Jesus, after the Lamb takes the scroll from God, we say, and when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Now, here we go again. The elders fall down, and they fall down at the feet of Jesus, and they start worshiping him. Now, earlier they were worshiping God for who he is. Now they're worshiping Jesus for what he's done, okay? Now, like I said, he's the star of the show. Now, you notice that we, they have the harps. Well, harps are throughout the Old Testament instrumental in worship, so that's the first thing it speaks of. But it also was also noted as a part of prophecy. Whenever you saw harps, oftentimes you would see prophecy about to be fulfilled. That's what's being illustrated here. Now, the golden bowls of incense are the prayers of the saints. Now, we're all saints. If you're a, if you're a child of God, you're a saint. Let's, let's get that clear. Holy ones, that's a saint. And so, if you're a saint, you know, uh, we're talking about, are we talking about the tribulation saints? Or are we talking about all saints for all time, including the rapture church that's in heaven? We don't really know. My guess is we're talking about the tribulation saints. And those will be the ones who have accepted Christ during the tribulation period. Now, basically, he's praying that Jesus will make things right and take them home. Now, it could also be all the prayers of all the saints throughout history. The comforting thing to know is our prayers are reaching the presence of God. Okay? Now, I do want you to remember there's going to be a tremendous revival in the tribulation period. There's going to be thousands and thousands and thousands of people who have never heard the gospel preached, so they never had the opportunity rejected, who are going to accept Christ. Now, we're going to get into it as we go forward. The 144,000 evangelists, spirit-filled Jews, they are there to spread the word, okay? They're there to preach the gospel, and God puts a seal on them. They can't be touched. So they're going to walk pretty much scot-free during the tribulation period while all the other saints are going to be persecuted. Now, we're going to also see two witnesses, which many believe is the reincarnation of Moses and Elijah. We're going to talk about them. And they're also spreading the gospel. So we still have, you know, the presence of evangelism in the tribulation period. Like I said, many of them will turn to Christ. Now, I want to point something out. 
Um, I'm guessing that the Lord, you know, uh, foresaw that some people might want to just, you know, just live their life for themselves and then, you know, at the last minute accept Christ if they found themselves in the tribulation period. Well, you know, he sends a delusional spirit out to the people who have rejected Christ and so they buy into the Antichrist, so they're not able to turn back to Christ after that, okay? So you don't get two bites of the apple. You can't decide that I'm going to you know, live out my life, and then in the last minute, you know, I go through the tribulation period, I'm going to accept Christ, and I'm going to be good. Because if you've rejected Christ outright, you're going to receive that delusional spirit when the Antichrist makes the scene. You see that in, uh, I, think it's, I think it's 2 Thessalonians, it might be 1st, okay? I uh, it's second. Now, Revelation chapter, uh, well, first of all, they sing a new song. It said, with your blood, you made them a kingdom, made them to serve as priests, reign on the earth, talking about the millennial kingdom that's going to be established when we come back with Christ, okay? Now, that's going to get a little deep for everybody. At that point, you'll be used to things getting deep. We're going to talk about when Christ establishes his thousand-year reign. Now, who did he do this for is the more important question. Who did he spill his blood for? For us, you know. We are up there singing. Remember now, we're the rapture church. This is a picture of us. We are up there singing these songs. And we are so very, very grateful. We are praising him for our salvation. You know, when you think about it, Everything that you're dealing with in your life, no matter how difficult it is, and some of you are dealing with some really difficult things, none of that is going to matter when you're up there in heaven. You're going to be so incredibly grateful that he died and saved your soul and you accepted what he did, and you're up there that you can't help. It's just going to be overcoming you know, your whole being. You're going to be pouring out worship, pouring out worship. Have you ever been so grateful? I know each and every one of you have. God has done something powerful in all of our lives many, many times, and it was like the biggest hurdle you ever thought you would ever have to face, and all of a sudden God does what God can do, and you just that gratitude just flows out of you. You know, you, you don't think about it. It just pours out of you, right? Well, that's what we're seeing there. You know, these, these all heavenly beings, and keep in mind the 24 elders representing the church, we're seeing them pour out gratitude for what Jesus has done in worship. Think about that. Now the trick is to remember how blessed you are while you're still here on earth. Okay, that's the struggle. Now look at Revelation chapter 5 verse 11. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousands times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang worthy is the lamb who was slain, yeah, I don't think y'all got down, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said amen and the elders fell down and worship. Now in Philippians we see that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's effectively what you're seeing there. You know, you're seeing every being in heaven. You're seeing the rapture church. You're seeing the, the, the uh, Old Testament saints who have not been resurrected. You're seeing the angels. You're seeing them all just praising God, praising Jesus. Okay, that's powerful. Now, anybody got any questions? You know, some of the things that are that we're talking about that are, are more related to, to Revelation is, you know, the war in Israel. Uh, that thing's getting ready to bust open. Uh, and I'll remind you what I said a couple weeks ago. Uh, in Ezekiel, there is a battle that takes place, and many people believe it's in the middle of this tribulation period, and uh, where some nations converge on Israel. And basically try to take her off the, off, the, off the map. And one of the nations is, is Russia. And if I'm not mistaken, another one is Persia, which is Iran. Now they, you know, it's, it's in the Bible and it's written, I think that was written 700 years before Revelation. And where they're going to converge on Israel. So obviously my point is they're upset at Israel. 
very, very upset at Israel. Now, keep in mind what's been happening over there in Palestine, when, you know, with, in Gaza. Um, they, and I, I admire Israel. They are taking no prisoners. They've been picked on all this time, and they say, we're going to get you. We're going to take care of you. They, they done took out the, the successful, uh, the, the leader that was supposed to succeed, uh, the guy in Hamas. They knew who he was, too, and they took him out a couple of days ago. They're not playing, and I don't blame them, but in the process, they've killed 42,000 people. So we see, we're here in America, and we see that, and we don't blame them, most of us, because, you know, they, they started it. You know, we don't like to see humanity, you know, we don't like to see that take place. Nobody does, and that's a tragedy. Absolutely, I pray for those people. But my point is, it has happened. So the Arab world and the rest of the world that are not our allies and not allies of Israel, they are very, very upset, and you can understand why. So you can see why uh, these nations would eventually get to the point where they converge on Israel in the battle of Gog and Magog, which is in Ezekiel. So Israel's definitely something to be watching. And the other thing, as we mentioned, that we need to watch is we all lament the fact that people are turning away from the faith. Well, that's biblical. You know, there's going to be a great apostasy before the end times. There's a great turning away from the faith. Now, there's various reasons, and I will say that Christians, you know, are not innocent in the reason because I don't think as a whole Christi Christians have represented Christ the way we should. Okay, I feel pretty good about this group, but I don't, you know, necessarily feel so good about the rest of the, the country and, you know, in the world the way we've represented Christ. We've done some really stupid things that have messed up our credibility. But regardless, there's going to be a great turning away from the faith. I don't understand exactly what mechanism God's going to use, but it's biblical. Well, we're seeing that. We're seeing people that are turning away from Christ in droves. Churches are dying. Churches are closing. And that's just the way it is, right? So we're seeing a lot of that. And then, you know, the lack of mora mortality, uh, morality that we're seeing. You know, I mean, it's, it's incredible, the, the lies and the deception that we're seeing, and, you know, uh, Jesus says that's going to be a part of the end times too in Matthew chapter 24, which is the Olivet Discourse, which we're going to weave in and out of this. You know, he, he's saying that's going to be a problem. You know, there's lies and deception or misinformation. I've never in my life seen so m much misinformation. You know, you, if you want to know the truth, you're just going to have to really work and research. You can find the truth, but you can't take the, the word of the first person that you listen to. Because they got an agenda, and the bottom line, their agenda is to make as much money as they can. You know, and so the more the hate sells, and they keep you hating somebody, then they're going to make plenty of money. Trust me. Uh, money's the root of all evil. Okay? The love of money, anyway. Anybody got any comments about that? <laughs> Are you depressed? <laughs> <laughs> We haven't got going yet. <laughs> Nobody's got any? Well, what does it do, you know, so far, and we haven't really, we haven't even entered into tribulation period. That starts in chapter 6. Uh, what does is, what is the book do to your, your faith, your, uh, what kind of adjustments do you feel like you need? I'm losing my voice again. Anybody? Does it make you want to practice your faith in a more serious way? Yes. And it also is a reminder that we need to be up. You know, and, you, know you, don't, you don't need to wait around. You need to take care of it. You know, Steve, um, John and I were at the when you were talking earlier about you know, we're all going to talk about somebody that we come across.
Praise the Lord. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. When when God answers a prayer that you you know is very dear to your heart, you know, you might not can see or feel or touch that. Well, you can feel it, and and God lets you know. Said so that was me, buddy. <laughs> I took care of that for you. Uh, and and you know, let me tell you the biggest uh, testimony that we all have and the miracle that we all have and we don't think about it, is a changed life. Because, you know, the fact that I'm a preacher is a miracle. You know, and Donna will tell you that, my sister. And, you know, but John, you're a miracle. Uh, all you guys, you know, accepting Christ and living in a different way, that's a miracle. And the people that have known you, they look at that and they say, I know people look at me, they might, I don't know what they think of me, but they know I'm different, and they look at me and say, well, something got hold of that boy. Something got hold of that boy, you know. <laughs> they might not agree to this Christ, but something got hold of that boy. He's been doing some drugs. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the last thing I will say is, to me, the most effective way to witness, there's two ways. First of all, the most effective, there are many ways to witness, but the most effective is to show them Tell them what God's done for you, okay, and tell them how the difference he's made in your life and share some of the things that you struggled with so you can offer that bridge and show them that there's a path. You know, you offer, you offer yourself as a bridge of how to get there. And the other way is acts of kindness, just plain acts of kindness. Just make, make it a habit of, you know, being kind to everyone you meet and showing them Christ that way, that'll open up more doors than you can imagine, okay? 
a lot of times you don't even have to do anything. You know, just it, just showing showing kindness everywhere you go, like Hansel and Gretel. You know, leaving kind acts and deeds everywhere you go that will open up doors. So, anybody got anything else? I'm asking it you personally. Makes me really excited to, to practice that. Absolutely. Yeah, because yeah. I've heard it said if you don't like to come to church and worship, yeah, you're like really it. not going to like yeah. that. Yeah. Because that's pretty much what we're going right. to do. Yeah. Well, I think we, I don't have Betsy tonight. I can, I can run over. <laughs> she, I, I've been instructed to keep it on time. All right. <laughs> All right, well, pull out your prayer list. It's very important. Obviously, 